It's a national icon, an engineering masterpiece, and a war winner. For a decade, the Spitfire lit up the skies. The British Spitfire had proved to be one of the deadliest weapons ever put in the hands of man. Now it's more popular than ever. They just stand for courage and victory and all those kind of things. And at one of Britain's greatest wartime airfields, it's being brought back to life. There I was sitting there in amongst a 12 grand lump of wreckage, basically, but feeling quite pleased with myself that I now owned a Spitfire. Over the course of nine months, we'll be following this small team of engineers as they rebuild Spitfires. It's a wobble pump. Explore their history. Gosh, look at that. And give veterans another chance to fly. Uh, wonderful. They'll be using many of the same plans, tools and methods as their 1940s counterparts. I've got to warn you, there probably will be some banging, clattering and... Oh. And scouring the planet for as many original components as they can find. I want 15 grand. But they're on a budget, they're on a deadline. Got to do it today, otherwise um, we look like a bunch of idiots. And those planes have got to fly. Welcome to the Spitfire factory. This time, at the Spitfire factory, construction begins in earnest on a very special restoration project. This aeroplane is complete and it contains all the components that it would have left the factory with in 1943. Now that's pretty rare, very rare in fact. But her engine rebuild is not entirely going to plan. The problem is, until you have all the parts that you need to rebuild an engine, you don't have an engine. One of the pilots is off to Southampton to explore the Spitfire's origins. So you're telling me I'm, I'm holding the only surviving bit of the first the Spitfire. And the factory is about to get an unexpected but very welcome visitor. It's possible that that aircraft was flown by me. In the summer of 1940, a legend was created. As Britain's pilots and ground crew risked their lives to defend the country, one aircraft above all others came to symbolise victory. An extraordinary achievement of design and engineering, loved by both pilots and public. Eighty years later, more Spitfires are flying than almost any other World War II aircraft. And those that can afford to, will pay millions to own one. Which means here at the Biggin Hill Heritage Hangar, owner Peter Monk has been able to pursue his dream. I've got a bloody Spitfire bit in my pocket. It keeps digging in my rib. It, I'd throw it away if it wasn't worth a thousand quid, so uh, I'm gonna go and file it. 20 years ago, Peter built a Spitfire in his garage at home. All right, Jay. Now he employs nearly 30 staff. We're just topping up on energy before you start the next row of rivets. Some are highly trained engineers, others young trainees learning on the job. Which one, what are you on now? Over the years, he's amassed a vast collection of original parts. I've got something here which is a, which is a canopy jettison ball. It's an original part. What Peter doesn't know about Spitfire parts isn't worth knowing including their value. Look, if that touches the side once, that could just destroy that. Today's a big day for Peter and his engineering team. They're planning a big step forward for their most important build of the year. A 1943 Mark IX Spitfire that Peter has promised to restore and get back in the air within the next nine months. MJ755 is the last survivor of over 250 that were sold post-war to the Greek Air Force. It fought in the Greek Civil War and last flew in 1953. After decades sitting in a museum, the funds were raised to ship it back to Britain for restoration to flying condition. Peter's team has spent months stripping it down and evaluating every single component. In any restoration, he wants to use as many original parts as possible. And this one is proving a bit of a gold mine. This is a nice piece. This is the unrestored throttle quadrant. The engine keeps you in the air 
and this is what you control it with. And the beauty of it is, it's 100% complete. There's nothing missing. These are nice original components. These are the, the rudder pedals. You know, this wear dates back to service during the war with the Royal Air Force. This is the ultimate part of any aircraft, given a known history, is the control column, the control stick. So the pilot's hand would be on here. The top part of the button is for firing the cannons. The lower part for the machine gun. We push the centre and it lets everything go at once. This aeroplane is complete and it contains all the components that it would have left the factory with in 1943. Now that's pretty rare. Very rare, in fact. Over the coming months, 7,000 parts will be reassembled one by one. Over a dozen engineers will be involved, including specialists, experienced restorers and trainees. This painstaking process will require thousands of hours of labour and cost about £2 million. Peter will need to send regular updates to the charitable trust in Greece that is funding the restoration. Each month I send photographs and um, a description uh, of exactly where we are and obviously a comparison where it should be on the project plan. Today, Peter's hoping to tick off stage one of that project plan. So far, the main fuselage has been assembled in a jig, rather like scaffolding on a building. The dimensions are within, all within a few thousandths of an inch, which without the jig, that wouldn't be possible, so the wings wouldn't fit. There would be so many errors within the aircraft, it's very likely to still fly, but not handle as well as it was designed to do. Now it's time to take it out. From the start to the process of uh, reconstructing the fuselage, it progresses very quickly, then it gets to a stage where it starts to slow up because it's in the jig. The jig actually hinders the progress. The design of the fuselage was one of the Spitfire's great innovations. It's a semi-monocoque built on a skeleton of 19 lightweight frames, on which a thin metal skin is tightly stretched, providing strength and rigidity, but minimising weight. Just move this out of the jig, which is quite a significant step in any aircraft rebuild. And uh, at this current point in time, I'm putting what we call a transit bar on, which is this structure here, which just means that you can manhandle the fuselage a bit easier. It hasn't fallen apart yet, so it can't be too bad. We're moving the actual fuselage jig to another position, so then we can bring back the Greek Spitfire back in its position where the, it was in the jig, so then we can finish off all the rivets that we couldn't get to it whilst it was in the jig. With so many aircraft in different stages of repair, moving anything around the hangar is a challenge. And you don't want to be crashing this half-ton beast. I think we should put an engine on it so I can take it to the shops and do my shopping. Gently does it, boys. After months of painstaking work on the frames and panels, the team is rewarded with something that's starting to look a little like an aeroplane. It's a morale booster for the guys. They see all these little pieces that have been through the paint stripping and the beat blasting process. So it goes from the, the dirty stage of the job, which is right at the beginning. So now it's out, we can actually progress a lot more quickly. Well, now it's back in position. I can carry on working on it and um, get to all the bits that we couldn't get to when it was in the jig. The mood changes within the engineers that are working on it. They've become more excited and obviously for the owner as well they can actually start to see what they're paying for. 500 temporary fasteners can now be replaced with rivets and work can begin on the internals. Within two months, we'll be almost at a stage of where we can't go any further without putting the wings on and that'll be the next big, jit, big leap for the project. There are now a little under 7,000 parts and about 70,000 rivets still to go. No problem. Peter Monk's obsession with the Spitfire began 23 years ago when he was a frustrated pilot working for an airline. In the first instance, having a nice uniform, it was great, I enjoyed it. But it meant uh, uh, quite a bit of time away from home, hotels, which I like to think are quite, quite an active person. But, and sitting around 
it, it isn't me. That's the, that's the, that was the problem. In the end, I, I just didn't like it anymore and I couldn't wait to, to get away from it. Peter's road to Damascus moment came when he was asked to fly a Spitfire back to Britain. That flight across the English Channel, looking at the White Cliffs of Dover, and just thinking about the 19, 20 or 21 year old crossing that channel, seeing those White Cliffs of Dover, praying that the engine is gonna keep running and what that stood for. I always think back to that flight. When I think about Spitfires, I'll never forget it. I was in awe of that, that flight, I was in awe of the whole thing, that whole day. Um, and it hadn't dawned on me uh, at, at that time that this could never happen again. The only guarantee is to own one. So, in 1996, he cleared out his garage and bought the rusting remains of a Mark IX. Just look at this aircraft here. Can you imagine that 23 years ago, I collected it in a transit van? It was not a great deal of it. It was, uh, what, what there was of it was recognisable, but just big enough to get into the back of a transit van. To the untrained eye, it, would have, it probably would have looked like I was on my way to the scrapyard. But I can remember I put it on the patio at home and uh, set it up and, uh, well, jokingly, I put a, a, a kitchen chair in where the seat would be and I sat in it. So there I was uh, sitting there um, in amongst a 12 grand lump of wreckage, basically, but feeling quite pleased with myself that I now owned a Spitfire. From there, Peter's hardest challenge was not figuring out how to build his Spitfire, but finding all the parts to do it. So this uh, rudder came from a, a Dutch car service station. It was hanging on their wall. The elevator, I was given the lead that there was an elevator um, hanging in the, in the office of a, a laundrette in the Midlands. Uh, and, and they'd been there for over 20 years. But I managed to buy it from them. We were able to use every last bit of it. I had a call from some aviation enthusiasts who said that there is a, a propeller spinner in an antique shop in uh, Seven Oaks, which is 10 miles away. I, I just didn't believe it. I went along to the antique shop. Sure enough, there it was bright, painted bright red. It was being used as an RAF Association collection box. The only disappointing thing is when I removed all the wooden structure, there was no money in it. <laughs> It took 10 years to restore it, so it first flew in uh, December 2005. The Spirit of Kent was Peter's first Spitfire love and will always have a special place in his heart. There are other aircraft in this hangar that I have bought. I I've walked straight past them, but this one I wouldn't. I always look at it and um, have a smile and think back of how it got here. And, and that's always going, to be the, always going to be the case. If somebody walks through the door with three million pounds, no, nah, not for sale. But there was no way that this was going to be the end of the story. So having finished this aircraft, I just felt so deflated because I, all of a sudden, it's almost like I didn't have a purpose anymore. Following all the leads, so many deals that have been done and trades and bartering, all of a sudden, nothing because the aeroplane's finished, it's sitting there, ready to go. What am I gonna do now? So I started another one. Peter now restores two-seater aircraft to operate flights for paying customers, while single-seater projects are funded by museums and private owners. This year, he and his team have no less than four restorations on the go, including the Greek Spitfire, which he must finish this year. Has he bitten off more than he can chew? Covered in seven-year-old crud now. Lovely. The Spitfire factory needs nearly 30 staff and associates to keep the business running. Pilots and ground crew operating a thousand two-seater passenger flights a year. Office staff, historians, and tour guides. Oh, press your gun button. Taka, 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 taka. <laughs> and a small team of die-hard volunteers. I've now been promoted to uh, OC Brooms and Mops. At the heart of the operation responsible for both the workshops and the customer flights is Chief Engineer Franco. I signed all the aircraft out to fly. 
Under his command, there's a team of 13 engineers. Used to be a vent, it's all good. It's a dream job for these guys. Some come with serious engineering qualifications. Others, like so many back in wartime, learn on the job. One such trainee has been assigned to work on the Greek Spitfire from start to finish. A latter-day Rosie the Riveter. This is Alex, Peter Monk's eldest son. You end up with white knuckle after a good day's riveting, which is a bit like pins and needles on steroids, and your hand goes white and it's quite painful, so uh, try and avoid that if you can. Is it? Many of the skills and tools required have barely changed for 80 years, including a lot of riveting. These are snaphead rivets. When you put them down, if you don't have either a decent snap or the snap level, you end up with a little ring on one side. And we call that a smiley face because it, it looks like a smiley face. The whole point of putting a rivet down is it's got a colour and you want to try and keep the colour of the rivet and keeping it look nice. So um, if you don't do that right, you get Mick taken out of you when you go into the crew room because someone says, oh, he's put smileys on something, and you go, please don't. The tools and techniques are similar, but the philosophy here is very different to 1939. Back in wartime, when they were obviously in serious production of these fuselages and any other parts, they were rattling these out in a matter of weeks. They had all the parts on the shelf. I mean, there's so many people involved in, in making these. You know, you had a team just making frames or this particular frame. They did nothing but make that frame. So there'd be stocks of them on the shelf. Um, the actual construction of a fuselage will be very quick. Now, trainee engineer Richard might spend a whole day making a single new part. They're all being handmade and it all takes time because you've got so many small individual and unique pieces. You can't really just industrial like scale mass produce stuff like this. Peter demands an attention to detail that they couldn't afford 80 years ago. That's the satisfaction of doing stuff like this. Being able to hands on and physically actually say, OK, I made this piece by hand. With 10 Spitfire restorations under his belt, Peter knows what he's doing but he wouldn't say no to a time machine. Go and visit, see how they did it. Um, yeah, it would be fantastic. Of course it would. Any, anybody would like to go and have a look, wouldn't they? And also raid their parts stores as well whilst we're at it and bring those back up to date. So it might save us a lot of time. <laughs> Today, Richard and Alex are using another traditional technique to rebuild one of the Greek Spitfire's wings. This is like the key structural member of the wing, if you like. It's got the two main spars, which we split into upper and lower spars, and then you have a sheet of metal, which is in three pieces made of aluminium, and that is the web, if you like, and it spaces the spars apart, which we then rivet into the wing behind you here. Without this, the wing would be pretty floppy. Spitfires are famous for their elliptical wings, which help reach speeds of over 400 miles an hour. To achieve these speeds, the wings have to be both light and strong. So, like the fuselage, a thin metal skin is mounted on a lightweight frame, which has front and rear spar sections that provide strength and rigidity. At the moment, we're putting in the uh, bolts through that hold the spar to the spar web. Like most things in aviation, you don't want nuts and bolts to come loose. You have to devise ways of locking them. And in this case, this is a pretty permanent way of locking it, and it's called peening. So what I'll do is I have a piece of metal with a bit of a point on the end of it and a pretty hefty hammer. And Richard's got a, a big old weight and he'll hold that weight on the end of the bolt to take the impact up and I'll smack it and then by putting the little divots in there stops the nut from coming undone. It's seriously hard work, but Alex doesn't right. expect any special yeah. favours from his dad. It's not really father and son in the hangar, really, not, not, not at all. Always running around the hangar with my backside on fire. I don't have. I actually never see you. No, I, I just see this vapor trail around the hangar, and that's, there's me at the front of it normally. But only if he's got a, a, a bag of um, chocolate peanuts that I'll go and pinch. If I want to get hold of him to actually ask a question, I have to lure him in with a bag of chocolate peanuts on the top of my <laughs> toolbox. Because <laughs> you can't get hold of you on the phone or anything. That's just impossible. So, rivet by rivet, bolt by bolt, Alex is learning how to build a Spitfire the hard way. It's quite cool because um, doing so many different things in the company, 
a chance to be a bit of a jack of all trades. This is sort of, for me and Richard, the fullback. If there's nothing else going on, we'll be working on this airplane. But there is one major component that doesn't get restored in-house. The Greek Spitfire's Merlin engine has been sent here. Hidden away in a Gloucestershire village is one of the world's foremost aero engine restoration facilities. The fact is that we're doing the, the propulsion side and Peter's doing the airframe. With his own team of dedicated restorers, Peter Watts is immensely proud of what he has achieved here. This is the engine shop. This is where all the, the, the engines are overhauled. And there's various bays, and each bay is allocated its shelf for all its parts. And normally there's about eight engines on the go at any one time. Most of which are Merlins. During World War II, Rolls-Royce employed 22,000 people to build over 170,000 Merlin engines. Over the course of the war, the iconic V12 doubled in power to almost 2,000 horsepower. It was also used in Hurricanes, Lancaster bombers and many other aircraft. And without the Merlin, Britain may well have lost the war. Now Peter's small business and a few others like it are all that remain to keep the legend alive. We've got four stores like this. What we're looking at here in front of us is probably the largest collection of uh, Rolls-Royce Merlin crankshafts in the world. And there's a whole range of cylinder skirts, um, cylinder heads, um, superchargers, wheel cases, all manner of things. A number of them um, all need uh, work doing to them before they can go back into engines. But you can never have enough parts. Problem is, until you have all the parts that you need to rebuild an engine, you don't have an engine. And while we have lots of parts, we are certainly rapidly running out. So Peter has built a manufacturing shop where they use original Rolls-Royce designs to make parts from scratch. The Greek Spitfire's Merlin engine is being rebuilt with a combination of new and original parts, 14,000 of them in all. And it's been particularly challenging. You can look at what parts have arrived. What you can't do is to assess the condition of them until they've all been cleaned, measured and inspected, and therefore you know what is possible to go back into the engine and what needs to be rejected. A little bit more buggering about than the normal overhaul. Peter estimates the rebuild will take around 2,000 hours of work in total. And the clock's ticking. The engine needs to be ready to test in just a couple of months' time. Back at the Spitfire factory, there's a problem. I suddenly looked at the air pressure and it's right down on nearly nothing, so I thought that's obviously a leak. Didn't know where the leak was from, so better to be safe, come back here. The engineers just checked it, put the brake on, and it's leaking out the right bag. When one of the two-seaters is grounded, it's all hands on deck and restorations must take a back seat. The Spitfire factory operates up to 12 two-seater flights a day to customers with deep pockets. Starting at over two and a half grand, it's a luxury day out that just can't go wrong. But this aircraft has a problem with its air brakes. You've got to think as an old fashioned car with the brake shoes rather than discs. And the uh, air comes down this pipe and inflates a bag that's underneath these shoes. And it inflates, which pushes the shoes against the inside of the wheel, uh, which uh, causes it, the wheel to break. So it's the bag underneath these shoes. It'll be probably a tiny, like a puncture on a bike, bicycle tyre. Rather than spend time fixing the puncture, oh, Joe is replacing it. A new bladder is costing Peter a thousand pounds, but that's better than keeping the customers waiting. They are not easy to get on. Yeah. It's on and ready to test. Yeah, just gently. Any telltale hissing? Yeah, 
Lovely. It's good news for the next customer, who's been waiting patiently for his trip of a lifetime. It all went to plan. Um, now I've just got to do all the paperwork. They operate a thousand of these flights a year. It's a chance to experience the speed and manoeuvrability of the Spitfire in the same skies where the Battle of Britain was won. Absolutely fantastic. And once in the air, you can even take the controls. Mitchell is a genius. It flies beautifully. Heavy engined aircraft, but you don't have to heave it around the sky. An aircraft from that era to have so much power, it was so much in front of its time. To find out why the Spitfire was so ahead of its time, one of the pilots, Anna Walker, is heading to the location of the original Supermarine factory, Southampton. Pride of place in the Solent Sky Museum is one of the planes that it evolved from. Gosh, look at that. A racing seaplane, the Supermarine S6A set a world speed record of 357 miles an hour in 1929 and won a famous pre-war air racing competition, the Schneider Trophy. Hello, how are you doing? Thank you, thank Excellent. you. Paul. Museum expert Andy Jones knows chapter and verse of its history. And it was that great period when technological advances were being done through competition. So you had like newspapers or wealthy people were putting up great big prize, prizes for great monetary prizes to say the first man to cross the channel, the first person to fly around a course and all that kind of thing. The brains behind Britain's challenge was the legendary R.J. Mitchell. Promoted to Supermarine Chief Designer, aged just 24, over the next 12 years he saw air speeds double. And in the spirit of racing, he was happy to combine his own ideas with the best on display from France, Italy and the USA. The trophy took place as a series of laps round a course, so the planes had to turn quickly as well as be fast. Over a million people came down to the Solent to watch the 1931 race, and they had to lay on special trains. Strange enough, even in 1931, they had to have special car parks for people to park in, because um, there were that number of people that came down. All the news crews were down there, the Pathé News, Movie Tone News, recording what was going on. It was everywhere. It was a big thing. The Schneider Trophy was won three times in succession by the RAF. The planes streaking at 340 miles an hour indicated the enormous strides taken by aviation since the last war and its likely importance in the next. That year, the Air Ministry put out a call for a new British fighter, and Mitchell's team began work on a prototype. With its speed and agility, the S6 was the perfect starting point. One of the, the facts I love about this aircraft is she looks gorgeous and she looks brilliantly, you know, sort of aerodynamic and super, and sexy, super sexy aircraft, yeah. but everything on it is functional. The seaplane's speed and agility came from its low weight, smooth, streamlined shape and low-slung wings, all of which the Spitfire would eventually inherit, as well as many of the interior features. So how does this feel to, um, to comparing it to a Spitfire? It feels very familiar. Um, it, it feels as comfortable, it feels safe. There are lots of similarities, you know, the way the cockpit is built. I feel, feel at home. Andy takes Anna up to the archive to meet his dad, Alan, who interviewed some of the team that worked on Mitchell's prototypes. But those people I've spoken to that were working in a factory at the time, they did really think there was something special. Obviously, when it was in a factory, it must have looked very, very modern. The one thing you get was this incredible sense of pride right from day one, that this was, this was going, to be, going to be the, the, the bee's knees. Very little remains of the original Spitfire prototype. A model, some photographs. I've got one picture here. This was um, when she did a false landing. This, um, but she then crashed again later, didn't she? Well, she crashed at Farnborough eventually, of course, which was her demise. So what happened to this aircraft? There was a young man at the time at Farnborough, and um, he came to see me when he was very, very much older. Yeah. And he said, <laughs> um, I, I was the apprentice that was told to go out to that aircraft and as an exercise with my friend to scrap the aircraft because high-speed steel was mm. very, very hard to get, yeah. uh, what they thought they, they'd do, and they both did it, was to keep a pin, one of the wing pins of the aeroplane, yeah. and not just keep it as a pin, but turn it into a hammerhead. So yeah. this is the only piece 
of K504 that exists. That Spitfire. is where Spitfire DNA starts. That's it's, absolutely fantastic. So when you think then, from this, there's 20 or thousand Spitfires come after this piece of metal. So you're telling me I'm, I'm holding the only surviving bit of the first Spitfire, the prototype? Yes, I can That's say it. that with conviction. Gosh. That's incredible. K5054 was the culmination of five years' work, developing the elliptical wings, adding retractable undercarriage and the latest Merlin engine. When it achieved a speed of 348 miles an hour in 1936, the first 310 Spitfires were ordered. Tragically, RJ Mitchell died just one year later and didn't live to see his creation defend Britain from invasion. 80 years on, it remains Britain's most treasured aircraft. Every single original component is now extremely valuable. And Peter Monk owns a hell of a lot of them. Welcome to his secret hoard. This is my private store, so nobody's allowed up here bar me. This is 30 odd years of, of, of collecting and really, without these parts, we would not be able to restore the Spitfires that, that we do. Some of these parts, they're the only parts that exist. This has to be some of the most valuable rusty metal in the world. There's stuff here that's in boxes that have been sealed up for decades. This stuff is very valuable. The, some of the least valuable stuff, things that we have here, these um, high gas primers used for starting the engine. You know, the cheapest version of this is approaching 300 quid now, and I've probably got um, 30, maybe 40 of them. In restoration, old parts trump new nearly every time. You could make this new, it would cost a lot of money, but this is, you know, this is an original piece. This goes in the fuel tank, so as the fuel level goes down, the float moves down. It's gonna cost you uh, around 1,500 to maybe 2,000 pounds to make that. Um, if you were to find an original one, you might pay £500 for it, but then you've got to overhaul it. That would cost at least another £1,000, so the costs are very similar. I can guarantee that if I could show an owner an unopened box, such as this one that's got a component in there that we can make, they would say, no, no, can we, can we please use this one and can I have the box? The rarer the parts, the more valuable they become. These are my favourite collection in this store. Now, I can lift one of these up, they're very heavy. So that's a complete undercarriage leg in its entirety. Very good condition, this one. I would suggest there's 250,000 pounds worth of undercarriage legs. Peter's collection should keep him in parts well beyond the current Greek Spitfire project. I think we're good for another 10 Spitfires if we really wanted to, or even more. I consider this storeroom to be priceless because I, it's, I can't replace it. If I was to sell everything and, and put a figure on it, even if it was hundreds of thousands or even millions, then um, what could I do with the money? So I'd sooner have something that I get a lot of enjoyment out of and seeing other people get enjoyment out of uh, than live in a bloody great house. You can't fly a mansion. How boring is that? You only sleep in it, don't you? So, Spitfire, oh, it's no comparison, really. Down in the hangar, Peter's son Alex is fitting a few more thousand pounds worth of restored parts to the Greek Spitfire. What I'm doing now is I am bolting in the tail strut, so the tail wheel will sit here about here where my chest is and then this pivots like that. The tail section of a Spitfire is assembled separately. Before it can be attached, the tail wheel strut and its damper must be installed. They won't be accessible when it's all bolted together. I've been here for a while now doing this and it's rather uncomfy and it looks a bit intimate really, if I'm honest, but you know, it is what it is. This is a critical for us for getting it mobile with the with the tail on we can put the the tail wheel assembly on um, which will make the make the fuselage mobile because we're preparing to take it round to the paint shop 
Enter the holder uppers. I want to attack it with a death wheel. Wartime workshops employed hundreds of unskilled workers, mainly women, to hold bits in place for the riveters. Come on, boys, they're missing. Just get it on there. Yeah, yeah. Alex gets some burly blokes instead. Right, it down at the back. Hello. Thanks to the precision of the jig work, this should line up. Mind your fingers. No, it's hard to imagine thousands of planes being built this way during the war. That one's pierced. No. That's it, go on, go on, go on. Yep. You're in. You're right. Finally, it's in position. And Richard gets the job of putting in the bolts. From the inside. Have you got any at the top yet? There's no other way you can bolt this up other than having someone in there putting the bolts through one at a time and bolting it together. Can you get a couple of TBA ones up high? Luckily, at the moment, all the wires and cabling aren't installed, but it's still very challenging and only really sort of quite skinny people can really actually do this. <laughs> That's the reason why I'm doing it. What happens is when you get your Australian and you put them in a confined space, it tends to make them a bit unhappy. There you go, you can have my finest Allura 2BA spanner. Oh, that sounds promising. It's more or less done. Rich is just finishing up inside and um, everyone else has gone back to what they were doing before. It's a step closer. It's a big segment of structure on the airplane and makes it look a lot more like an airplane. Seeing the sort of small little details that you've had to make on it sort of finally come together. That's quite a, quite a, yeah, a nice personal experience. Another piece of the Greek Spitfire jigsaw is in place, but more parts are needed. Peter needs to go shopping. Despite his vast collection of Spitfire parts, Peter Monk knows that every build requires some pieces he doesn't have. So today, he's off to visit an old mate and sparring partner who may have a fuel gauge he needs for the Greek Spitfire. The stuff I've got here is um, extremely rare. This is our sort of holy of holies sort of store parts. This room is completely stacked out with stuff and it's the result of 40 years of collecting aircraft spares. Guy Black also builds new parts and has his own restoration projects. So he's not always keen to share. Duncan. Yes? Could you just hide something for me? Guy does not uh, openly sell these bits and pieces. You won't find them advertised and Guy doesn't need to sell them. He's a collector just like me and prefers to hang on to stuff. Over there, yeah, over there somewhere. So the fun here is if Guy's got a part that is useful to us, how am I going to get him to, to let it go? I've sort of got the idea of what he's looking for half the time, um, and the great challenge is to stop him taking the last bit I have, but he has his uncanny knack of spotting things that I've hidden away. Let battle commence. Good afternoon. Well... Just general look around? Yeah, well, this is the main oil filter for an early Spitfire, or indeed a Hurricane. And we've, we've got a, a future project where we're going to need this. We don't actually need it for another two years, but I'd rather make sure we've got it in the bag, because in two years' time, it, I can guarantee it won't still be on that same shelf. This is a special place, and there's parts in here that you won't find anywhere else. There's always something that uh, catches my eye that I know that guy isn't going to let go. If I had my way, I'd turn up with a truck and just take it all, but that's not going to happen. Ah. He's found the fuel gauge. Does that look about right? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. But Peter's not stopping now, and soon he sniffs out some of his favourite parts. Undercarriage legs. Of course, Guy knows it's a component Peter will pay almost anything for. What are you looking for, Peter? Corrosion. But these are very good, they look very shiny inside. I want 15 grand. Whew. 7,000. I'll show you something else. Time to get down to business. You've got two and a half thousand on there. 
Yeah. 1,500 would be better, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. golly. No, that hurts. No. Go on, 1,750. 2,000. Go on. What would you value this at, Guy? Well, they're on our website at, is it three and a half? No, never, surely. Peter's must-have part for the Greek Spitfire is the fuel gauge. Well, I valued at the uh, fuel gauge at 375 quid. Guy's valued it at 1,500. All instruments during the war were fitted with luminous dials so they could be seen in the dark. By me demonstrating to Peter that it still irradiated with this material confirms that it is an original item and not a replica. The expensive bits. So, what's the final bill? £400 for the fuel gauge and just over 15000 for everything else. What you're trying to do is present to someone an aircraft with the highest amount of original material possible in it. So you can say, um, and it's not a, 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 a replica. That's it. It's not always about just money. It's about knowing it's going to be used properly in the right aeroplane uh, for the right reasons. All right, Peter. And, um, yeah, see, see you next you time. Yeah. yeah, I'll start saving up. <laughs> the two friends decide to call it a draw. Back at the hangar, there's been a steady stream of visitors all day. But when a veteran stops by, they're always treated like royalty. 96-year-old World War II bomber pilot George Dunn flew Spitfires after the war. And he's heard about the Greek Spitfire restoration. This is uh, MJ755. It says here that uh, in February 1947, MJ755 was taken on charge by the Greek Air Force. Well, in February 1947, I was uh, testing Spitfires to go over to the Greek Air Force, so it's possible that that aircraft was flown by me. Of course, it doesn't quite look how George would have remembered it. Hello there. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Do you want a, do you want a seat or anything, or are you right No, I'm OK. It's possible that I may have flown this aircraft. I, w oh. I was testing Spitfires out in uh, Egypt at Ismailia yeah. in 47. OK. And we were testing them. OK. And then we would fly them about 10 at a time with a Lancaster Escort <laughs> over to uh, Athens refuelling at Cyprus. So I'm going to check my logbook. I've got it with me to see whether this will be one of those that I originally flew. It's, a, it's a, a bit of a needle in a haystack, but... Uh, you never know, though. It's possible. Oh, that'd be lovely. If that yeah. was... Um, if that did, I'd, I'd probably make my day in the rest of the week and probably the year, yeah. especially to meet someone that potentially could have flown the aircraft yeah. and put them back together. It'd be yeah. lovely. can't believe that you're only a year off. Uh, <laughs> you and me both. George has brought his wartime logbook to show are, Spitfire right? factory oh, yeah. historian Robin Brooks. That's, that's when I got to... 132MU. Right. Um, the logbook details every flight with aircraft numbers, dates and times. Could the Greek Spitfire be there? M M MA751. MA yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that's an MJ, that one over there. Yeah. An MK. MH. MJ. MJ624. Close, not close enough. Very close. But there's though. more. There's a whole page here. Right. Isn't it? OK, don't worry, there we are. MJ, MJ 755. We got it. He ah, did. Well, I'm... Where's Peter? <laughs> Peter? Good Lord. We've got the aircraft that George flew over there. Oh, I would not have believed that. It's a chance in a million. Oh, Word dear. spreads fast around the hangar. There we are, 755. Yeah. MJ yeah. 755. Bloody hell. How about that? And this boy's work rebuilding it. That's Alex's day, week and year, well and truly made. And George is the new Spitfire factory hero. Who would have believed, believed it is in our hangar here? And we have the very gentleman who flew it. Unbelievable. If him upstairs is uh, looking after me, I'll, I'll oh, I'm be sure back. Will. <laughs> I'm trying to get it done a bit quicker for you, if you want me. <laughs> OK. It's a tradition for veterans to sign the inside of the cockpit door and it's extra special when George actually flew the plane. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. That's made my day, that has. Oh, <laughs> my mind. <laughs> 24,000 Spitfires built, thousands of Spitfire pilots. What's left? A handful of Spitfire pilots left and uh, a handful of Spitfires. And yeah. fortunately, yeah. today we we're able to bring two back yeah. together again. Yeah. I'm hoping to see it wheeled out and uh, shake hands with the person that's going to fly it. Uh, and just look at it soaring up into the sky. The Greek Spitfire has got a long way to go, but a few months from now, everyone is hoping that George will be here to see her fly. <laughs>